Hey, Captain Brett here with the Marine Minute. We're here talking to Richie Summers of Shore Power Solutions on the beautiful Eastern Shore in Kent Island, Maryland. Richie, how you doing? I'm uh, pretty good. How you doing today, good. Brett? Thanks for coming uh, and letting me uh, visit with you to talk to you about you and your business, how you got started, and a little bit of history so we can tell our Marine friends what Shore Power is all about. So, sure, absolutely. Tell me, uh, you know, what's your genesis of, of, of your background? How'd you get started? What, what, what was the reason that Shore Power Solutions got created? So Brad, I grew up on a small island in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay where boating was the only way of life. It uh, provided uh, funds, financial for the people that lived there. It was the only way for transportation to and from the island. There is no cars or roads that go back and forth. So boats were what you lived for, lived on all day, every day. Wow. And just so for the folks that don't know and understand, where is Smith Island exactly compared to where we are here on Kent Island? So Smith Island's about 85 nautical miles south of here in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, right on the Maryland-Virginia line. Like I said, there is no roads that go there. The only way on or off of the island is by boat. Wow. And how was it growing up there as a young kid? Was it, I mean, pretty cool to live on an island or say you lived on an island or? It was a very different lifestyle growing up on the island. We had freedom that uh, kids nowadays wouldn't even be able to understand. Um, everybody watched everybody. Um, there was a few restrictions um, that we couldn't do that other kids on the mainland could do. But for the most part, it was a great. Great. How about Shore Power Solutions? What, how did you get started? So Brett, um, because boats was pretty much what I knew, grew up on, understood the fundamentals of how a boat ran, operated, and um, how important it was. I learned at a young age that I did not want to be a commercial waterman like uh, my father and grandfather and pretty much everywhere else. But boats is what I knew, what I had a passion for, understood. Um, so therefore, I went into a career where um, I could utilize that in a, every day and make a living off of it. Now, did you go to school to learn I, mechanics? Or? I did. After high school, I went to a uh, diesel college in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, graduated there at the top of my class. Shortly thereafter, I started with uh, Caterpillar. Worked there for almost 20 years um, in the Marine Industrial Service. Okay. And so in what we, I guess we could call that like a big box type store, what did you like about that type of work atmosphere compared to now being here on your own with your own business? So the big box store industry has changed drastically from when I started in the mid nineties to today. In the mid nineties, there was a lot less restrictions on the big boxes. Um, they were allowed to do a lot more than they can today, a lot less regulation. Um, safety requirements and our service that we provided back then was premier nowadays because they are so restricted on what they can and cannot do um, it holds them back drastically with us being a little bit smaller company but still having all the training professionalism we are able to exceed what they can do okay so when you got started what were, were any kind of roadblocks or obstacles that you had to overcome or face to get you to where you are now? No. Okay. So you just left the big box and started here and up and running. Yeah, I had already uh, gained a large customer base from being in the industry so long, 20 years a cat, growing up in the area. Um, people knew of me if they didn't know me personally. And I uh, have been fortunate enough to give uh, good service for over 20 years, so it gave me a big head start in the industry, get started on my own. Okay. How about challenges? What kind of challenges do you face as not only a business owner, but a marine technician? The biggest challenge probably nowadays is getting new young talent to come into the industry. You know, the kids are taught, yes, go to college, which um, I agree with, but um, there's not always a job out there for computer technicians. Um, there's still a huge demand for people to go out and actually repair things and work with their hands. And the young kids nowadays, their thought process is, I gotta work for a living. Okay. 
And how many staff do you have? Uh, we are currently staffed with myself and six technicians and two other office personnel. Okay. And what about the area that you service? Where do you go? Where don't you go? Uh, our general service area, 90% is probably right here on the Chesapeake Bay. We do expand and travel out further when need be as far as um, New York and as far south as the Bahamas. Okay. How about other services, uh, the short power, what else do you offer? Obviously, you do general service and maintenance. What else do you do? Uh, survey work or anything like that? Oh, absolutely. We probably are the largest marine engine diesel surveyor that I probably know about at all. Um, we average, some weeks we can do three to five uh, surveys for people buying new vessels or used vessels. Um, either one, it doesn't matter. So we have a huge following, or I should say, we do a large amount of engine surveys. Um, we also do a huge preventative maintenance. We'll go out with you, look over your vessel, tell you what has needs to be done in the future, what has been done in the past, and what you need to budget to help you going forth. So in regards to vessel maintenance, uh, what do you think is, a, is the biggest crutch that you see that people either don't do or rely on or think that prevents someone to having a happy boating experience? The biggest stigmatism is for most people going getting into the buying the larger diesel powered boats is they think oh diesel engines they last forever you turn the key and they go well that is true they can last much longer they're much more fuel efficient than a gasoline powered boat the downside is they are pretty you have to stay up on the maintenance on them most people aren't aware of the maintenance requirements that the diesel engine needs so educating them on what they have to do to keep it up and running for many years to come. So do you, do you find that the the brand new diesel boat owner has sticker shock when you talk to them about oil changes and servicing oil coolers and after coolers and all that or what's your what do you normally find in that aspect? So the newer the new boat owners it's not as bad because they just spent 1.5 to 5 million dollars on their new boat so they're used to these big numbers it's the people that are buying the used boats that that boat was originally 3 million and is now 500,000 that they can now afford well when the boat gets older it depreciates in value but that doesn't mean that the maintenance cost goes down the maintenance cost actually goes up and most people aren't aware of the cost involved so it's educating them on what they are buying and what is uh, needed to keep the vessel in good operating condition. It, it, it's usually a sticker shock. Once you sit them down and explain it to them and educate them, then your biggest battle is behind you. Wow. Okay, that's great. How about where do you see yourself in your business, you know, say five years from now? So Shore Power, I've been, we've been very fortunate here. Um, in our first five years of business, um, growth has been substantial. Um, we're still every day trying to hire and looking for new talent to come into the industry and hopefully in five years from now we're going to continue to expand over the next five years. Okay. So maybe a bigger facility but staying local? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Fantastic. You know, uh, as you know, I'm a big advocate on boating safety. I know we've talked about this before. Uh, there's been a lot of recent boating accidents and a lot of tragedy recently here on the Chesapeake Bay. What do you what can you tell our audience about your aspect of boating safety? What are the misconceptions? What do you see? It's actually pretty scary out there um, from my aspect when I sit back and look at it. Myself growing up on an island, being boating since I could walk, I could run a, I learned to run a boat. Um, so I'm pretty familiar. Not like driving a car. It's not like driving a car at all. But for the average person that may be, for instance, um, middle aged that goes into buying their first boat for their first time, they can just go sign the paperwork, here's your keys and good luck. Well, there's a lot more to boating than just putting the key in the ignition and turning the wheel. And um, I would recommend to anybody, young or older, and it is, uh, you're just getting started in the boating industry, uh, don't think that it's easy and you can just do that. Hire somebody, a friend, or a professional to teach you. Don't 
don't get the stigmatism that I need to be taught just because I'm 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So hiring a, a professional captain or attending C school or absolutely, coaching class. Absolutely, absolutely. I recommend? highly recommend it. There is way too many instances of boating safety issues that happen every year that are so avoidable that it's scary to the average boater that it, the situation even happened. So Richie, I'm here behind the camera. We're looking at a Caterpillar C12 and you're gonna show us a little bit about after coolers. Tell us why after cooler maintenance and, and uh, cleaning is so critical. Can you give us a quick rundown? Absolutely, Brett. One of the biggest items that are neglected on all diesel, high performance diesel engines nowadays are the after coolers. The after cooler service is extremely crucial to the longevity and life of the engine. After cooler failures probably leads to number one cause of major diesel engine failures nowadays. It doesn't matter the make, model, or manufacturer. Um, they're all similar in size and principle, and they all have the same principles and do the same job. They come in many sizes and forms. This particular engine is a C12, very common, dash or 3196, a lot of you may know it as. The aftercooler is actually located in this entire assembly right here. In order to service it, you have to take these collars, water pipes, assemblies in here all have to come off and apart. Also, uh, on the back end, the hot turbocharged air, this is where it enters. This is a 3196 aftercooler that came out of another engine that is in need of service and actually failed the pressure test. Fortunately, this customer caught it in time before it destroyed the entire engine, but it does need a new core. Um, the core, the air passes over these really tightly woven fins to cool the air going into the engine. Over time, these really tightly woven fins get black and full of gunk, as you can see this one is done. Um, this one is in dire need of service. When that happens, it reduces airflow, your engine will smoke more, it will burn more fuel, and over time can cause major engine damage. This particular core, Brett, came out of a Cummins QSC engine. This is a core that we just got back from being serviced, ultrasonically cleaned and tested. It's actually ready to go back in for reassembly but to uh, many people believe that they can clean these themselves. Um, and you, can, you can really see the difference between almost the, the gap between the fins on that one that's cleaned compared to this one that is full of gunk. That is correct. What a difference. Yep, and you need to make sure on whoever is doing your after cooler cleaning and servicing that they are actually getting these things ultrasonically cleaned and then repressure tested afterwards. A lot of your backyard mechanics and stuff online that people are reading are telling them to put these in baths of like simple green or spray nine and boiling them for an hour and it's good enough. That's not true. What that will do is only get the very outer layer clean but as you can see this core is very dense and those fins go the whole way through um, the only way to effectively service this is to have it ultrasonically cleaned and then retested to make sure that it is good what did, what exactly does ultrasonically clean mean what is that um, they're using uh, sound waves along with cleaning solution to pulsate the center core to help in the cleaning process to get the very center of it. Just a normal flow of fluid will only get the outside of the fins, but not the inside. But the ultrasonic pulsations that it creates will actually break down the debris in the center of the core. Wow. So a critical piece of what you would call a, a part of the lifeblood of the engine, yes? Absolutely. Uh, most people don't realize, even if the boat isn't being ran for many hours, most of your manufacturer specifications nowadays are two years and or 1,000 hours of service. Some are a little bit different, a little longer. Scania doubles theirs because of the robustity of their course. Um, some of the Cummins is three years. But no matter if the boat is actually ran or not, uh, because of the types of grease that is used on reassembly and the seals and O-rings that are involved in sealing the component, even if it hasn't gotten dirty on the air side, uh, the, grease, the special grease that's used needs to be reapplied in the seals and O-rings replaced every two to three years, even if the boat never runs, uh, to prevent leakage failures. 
So Richie, tell me about competition. Is there, I mean, what kind of competition do you face in your business here in the marine industry as a marine technician? It is a very competitive industry. We have a lot of large big box companies out there, but they're restricted on what they can do. And then you have a lot of small independent guys out there that are just trying to make a living. A lot of your small independent guys are good mechanics, but they are still also limited on the larger jobs and having the manufacturers back them when there is uh, larger issues that the factories need to get involved in. We're fortunately, I feel right in the middle where we have manufacturer backing and enough technicians to back us up when large situations occur, um, but aren't restricted as much as the big boxes. So when you say manufacturers, who are you speaking of specifically? Are there brands that you, de you guys deal with? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the majority of our work is on Caterpillar, Cummins. Uh, we are Scania and Man Dealer. Um, most of our repower that we're doing or new engine sales are in the Scania product line, um, mainly for commercial, and, but we are putting them in a lot of the new sport fish repower uh, applications. Um, we also deal with um, marine transmissions, twin disc and ZF. Um, we only do diesel and most of the larger name brands. Some of the smaller name brands um, that are few and far between out there, we don't really deal with those. And how about outboard motors? No, we do not deal with outboard motors. Anything gasoline powered, we tend to stay away from. We'll uh, lead customers into the right direction and recommend service providers for those applications. Okay, that's great. Well, Richie, I really appreciate you spending time with me today on the Marine Minute. I know our audience is gonna love the uh, insight you've provided and we look forward to seeing where your business goes here and into the future. Uh, thank you for your time, yeah, right? Thank you. Thank you. Guys, thanks for attending the Marine Minute today, and we'll see you guys sometime soon.